Thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Range. This is the January 2019, I almost said 2018, Q&A. Yeah. It's a new year, uh, a new us, a new everything, a new In Range, and new Q&A questions. All of them provided to us from our Patreon supporters at $5 and above. Mm-hmm. Different perks for different Patreon levels, Buyers Club for cool discounts on other stuff, as well as Q&A questions, Discord server, whatever. But uh, if you're one of those Patreon supporters, thank you. And hopefully your question got into the Q&A. There's always more than we can answer every month. There's just so many of them. So in this instance, we try to curate them and try to get to the ones that are repeat. And hopefully we did. So let's go ahead and start. All right. First question is from Joe. Hmm? It says, how come you stopped uploading your videos to Pornhub? I was actually watching them on there. Well, because you were one of the, like, five. <laughs> yeah, we found the one guy who was actually watching them on there. When that started, when we did that whole thing, that was, of course, kind of a... Of a what's the word to put a protest against some of the things going on with YouTube and the monetization or demonetization and all the things that are going on not even monetization the type of censorship that was going on at YouTube really um, and it did draw a lot of attention and it got a lot of um, well more publicity than I expected quite honestly the first video we posted on Pornhub there has actually something like 30 or 40 thousand views it got a lot and then after that really no one watched it there to be honest so I've maintained I didn't really expect anyone would well, I maintain the channel. I still have access to it. I could still post content there should something inevitable or unfortunate happen to YouTube. Or perhaps there's content we can't post on YouTube, like how to reload ammunition, which is sort of weird. But maybe that could go there if it had to be. But I haven't been uploading there recently just because there isn't the viewership. I mean, literally, the view numbers are in the double digits. Yeah. Which is what we have found to be the case with almost anywhere we put any content besides YouTube. Pretty much. Yeah. So... Uh, next up is Bryce. Uh, what piece or pieces of gear have you originally thought to be useless or impractical, but after testing, found to be very practical or usable? Ooh. Why don't you start with that one? Because I don't really have a good answer for that one. That's why. You don't? <laughs> I've been thinking about Something it. that's impractical uh, that we turned out to be useful? Hmm. You know, I'm going to go ahead. I guess the first thing that popped in my head was when we shot the World War One match months ago now. Um... I had essentially had those World War One style. What I mean, are they jack boots? What's the right word for those World War One style? Yeah, pretty much are jack boots. Jack boots. Um, those look. They actually were kind of useful because we turned out we actually had rain, and it was muddy conditions. And while it would be nice to have maybe some better traction on the bottom of those boots, they actually were pretty good for protecting from the elements and the goo. So I think that there was a there there. Okay. And so that was something that I looked at at first. I always thought of me it's like. Are these really practical? And yeah, I guess in the right conditions, I would say they actually turned out they were. Uh, thinking about it now, I would say the ZF41. Oh, that's a, even that's a better answer. That's the thing that its its publicity out there all says is pretty much this was garbage. It was useless. Total mm. crap. Yep. But that's pretty much based on using it in a set of conditions other than what it was actually designed for. Yeah, that was the problem. Is when they depl- with the, so they deployed they de- invented the ZF41 with the 1.5x long eye relief scope, and it was supposed to never be anything more than an augmentation to men in the squad that already were good marksmen. Right. It was supposed to be a designated marksman rifle, not a sniper rifle. Exactly. But then they pushed it into sniper service, and all the snipers are like, "This isn't a sniper scope. This is garbage." Right. Although it's the most mass-produced optic of World War II, and so a lot of them got out there, and the guys got forced to use them as sniper rifles, and they weren't. But when they are pushed into the DMR role, which is what they were intended for, they actually work. Yeah, they're not bad at all. Yeah, so I, that's a better answer than the boots. I think the ZF-41 is <laughs> an excellent answer. And uh, I really like the ZF-41 used in the appropriate role. Yeah. So that's a good answer. Uh, Fabian says, have you ever thought of doing live stream Q&As? No, I've never thought of it. And every time I see a question like this, I'm like, live stream, no. I don't know. What do you think about live stream? Because I'm sure this comes up with Forgotten Weapons, too. Um, I have actually done a couple of live streams with mm-hmm. Larry Vickers oh, okay. when I visited him. Yeah. And they're fun. They're fun. I can see the appeal. Um, personally, I think you guys get better information when we're able to curate some questions and think about them a bit before we address them. Yeah. Um, rather than off-the-cuff stuff. So that's why I've avoided doing it. I don't know why, I just have a queasiness to the whole live thing in general. It seems like it's something, another element to maintain. There's the concern about bandwidth. Is that, are people even seeing this right now? Is it like blurping or not? I don't know how many times I've watched a live stream and like it got all pixelated and weird or things yeah. like that happen. And I just feel like it's a little bit, I don't know. I, I personally think that you get better content out of us doing this and then editing it and then posting it in a, yeah. in a uh, dead stream format. Yep. What's the alternative to live stream? Is it dead stream? Yes. All right, so dead stream for me. Pre-recorded. Pre-recorded with no current television audience. No. Except all of you. That guy. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Daniel says, for the lever gun project, would a magazine cutoff and single load option have made a lever gun a more acceptable option to military adoption? I'm going to say no. Because you don't really... Hmm. Well... I'm going to say yes. I was going to say, because you don't really need, you can load the thing on the fly at any time, but I guess that's not really the point of the cutoff. So the point of the cutoff is so that you can basically have an officer controlling individual volleys of fire. Yeah. But I think a lot of, so in that case, in that, viewed from that perspective, maybe for the Continental Armies, yes, it would have. If you look at it the way our lever gun project is, it's kind of focused on the American West, the American Cavalry. Yeah. And those guys didn't generally have, you're not talking whole companies, like 100 men abreast at a time, firing volleys. This is much more like small unit skirmishing. And I yeah. don't know that the, the cutoff is nearly as important. But if there had been a cutoff, maybe the lever gun could have been deployed even to the larger, greater audience or greater army, right? So, I mean, <laughs> maybe a cutoff, even though it's pointless, would have been enough to get them to consider adopting it, well, at which point they could then not bother well, using the well, cutoff. No, right, but well, maybe, but I mean, think about it in this regard. So one of the concerns that comes with the lever gun project, which is a reasonable one, is resupply in the field. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem. It was a real problem in the frontier. It would have been a problem if you deployed something with higher rate of fire in general. Yes. It was a problem with trapdoors. So if you were to have, let's say, let's go with the 1876, which both you and I agree at this point was probably the best choice, mm -hmm. as not quite an inter intermediate, but pretty much a rifle cartridge. And it was slightly redesigned so that, like, let's say there's a little thing that you slide over, yeah. and you could run the lever to open the breech, throw around in the chamber, close it, fire it, and essentially use it like a trapdoor. All you'd have to do is add a little stop that prevents rounds from coming out of the magazine. And stops the lifter from lifting so that right. you can just open the... No, you can have the lifter go up and down. As long as a, mag a round doesn't oh, come out of the yeah. tube. Yeah, yeah. Although it would be nice to have some way to put the rounds easier into the chamber. But regardless, if you could do that, and then you could use it like you would use a single shot trapdoor, then that issue doesn't really become a problem. And the only when you go to the emergency need of enabling the magazine, let's say the Battle of the Greasy Grass or Little Bighorn or when the numbers are overwhelming, mm -hmm. then you still would have had that repeat capability of the lever gun. I think it makes a lot of, I think there's a point here. Maybe. I find it vaguely offensive that that maybe would have been the thing that would make it mm. considerable for the military. I think it might have, though. Yeah, but that's just annoying because it's stupid. <laughs> well, but instead they just went with single shots. Yeah, that, which is that worse. certainly solves That's even worse, right? So, I mean, yeah. if that had been the mitigating factor, that might have made a big difference. Maybe. It's possible. I think, there's a, I think there's a there there. I'll concede that it's possible. All right. Yeah, I think there's a there there. Benjamin says, I have seen several Russian or Belarusian optics on the channel with mixed results. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion of Russian or Belarusian optics quality? Have you been seeing improvement over the years? They're all over the board. Yeah. These things are all over the board. So these, these optics, like, you'll get one, like the 1P29 that I'm using, that I use in Tiger Valley. That actually, well, it's essentially a copy of the suit. Um... It's good. It's extremely durable. It retains zero. Clarity is excellent. It's got a rangefinder in it. It's really a really good optic. Um, the Obzor, which is their reflex sight, is fantastic. I love it. I've used a bunch of the red dot sights, and they're absolutely terrible. Like, the tube looks like you're looking through a straw. Or, um, what's that one, the PK-AS? Oh, it's supposed <laughs> to be a 1X optic, but you can actually see a prismatic line through the optical view which once you see it, you'll never not see it again because it's just there forever. And there's this terrible distortion field in general, like the outside's kind of distorted, the center is distorted, and you're supposed to use this with both eyes open, and all it is to me is nausea-inducing. Um, I, I haven't seen an improvement in Russian Belarusian sites. What I have seen is completely unreliable, undependable quality from one thing to another. OBS are good, PKS, awful. And so it's really per optical device quality like either, it just depends on which one you're using you know we don't really have that much insight into who's actually making these things no if you were to look at this from the outside and and have someone ask like what's your opinion on the quality of american optics your answer would be well we've got some companies that are great and some companies that are total garbage mm. and i suspect there's probably something like that at play here i do too but i think i what i was coming at this more was from not necessarily the quality of the manufacturer actually the quality of the manufacturer with the exception of a few have been pretty decent they're all pretty rugged Russian tank-like things. What, I, what I'm going at is the quality of the design or the concept. Okay. Like the PKAS is just, well, you have one. Remember, you look through it, it's pretty weird. <laughs> it's a weird optic. Um, and then, like, the Obzor is really good. And then the P... I, it's all over the board. The designs, what's interesting about Russian and Belarusian optics is that there seems to be a wider variety 
or an a, a, a ability to try different stuff. Yeah. They're willing to do something other than just make another red dot. And what happens is when you try to do something different, 99% of the time you make something awful. But every once in a while, something cool falls out of that brain. Yeah. And they've made a couple cool things. Yeah. So I think it varies depending on the optic. What, this car go by? Yeah. Anthony says a repeat question for Finnish Brutality 2019. What do foreigners need to know about competing in the Finnish match? Things like buying ammo, borrowing firearms, legal barrel length for rifle and pistol, etc. I put this in because this question comes up so much. I've got, mm. I don't know how many of these we've gotten. And the answer is, I have no freaking clue. Neither do I. And the reason I put it in here is so we can answer you. I don't know. So honestly, I don't know. I don't know. And I can't answer it. So yeah. I, I, I think you'd be, if you wanted to ask that question, maybe you'd be better off pinging the Vars Deleka guys. Yeah. Maybe. Or, I don't even know where I would, aside from them, I don't even know where I would start looking. Because you're dealing with international law here. It's not just Finnish law. It's like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, uh... If I travel internationally to do any shooting, I so far I have always borrowed a rifle at my destination. Yeah. I, don't, I have not even tried to take a gun with me. That's what we did with Finnish Brutality. We got there and they were provided us rifles and ammunition and pistols. So everything was there for us. And by the way, vice versa. When the Finns come here to shoot Desert Brutality 2019 coming up in just a couple months, or just in a month. <laughs> yeah, a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Um, they're borrowing all the gear and ammunition here. So they're not bringing any of their stuff with them, and we didn't yeah. bring any of our stuff with us. I think the answer for this kind of international type competition, unless you're doing something unique or want to deal with whatever legalities exist in that realm, uh, you're better off getting just borrowing stuff. Yeah, you need to have a friend in country to do something like this. That's, that sucks for people who don't. It sucks for us if we go somewhere where we don't, but that's that's my answer. There's probably some other answer, but I haven't spent the time or effort to find out. I'm sure there is a way to do it, but I don't know what's involved. I bet it's a nightmare. Yeah. Alex says, what your y'all's thoughts on the G36? Even with its extensive use of polymers, it's still six to eight pounds. Was it a little too ahead of its time? Do you think newer materials could reduce the weight? This is really for you, because I haven't really ever handled a G36. I don't think you're going to reduce the weight much. It is a very nice, handy rifle as it is. Um, I, having not actually shot a G36, just based on handling one, I think it's really a quite nice gun. I think everything's put together pretty well. Uh, I think the recent uh, scandal about them losing zero when they get shot too much is pretty much nonsense. Wasn't it when they get hot? Yeah, yeah. but it's hot as in, like... 350 rounds in 10 seconds, kind of hot. Oh, okay. Um, and the, the thing is, there is, you've got a metal trunnion in a polymer receiver. And the problem was, when it gets so hot that the the polymer starts to lose some of its strength, the trunnion shifts. Sure. However, this whole thing was designed around, I mean, it doesn't do that within its specifications as required by the German government when the gun was adopted. And every gun does something like this. I mean, this is the, the round count, or a, a an intensity of fire that's getting pretty close to the point where the gas tube will pop on an AR-15. Um, well, we know that happens with one full... The reason the amount of... Well, it's either a happy coincidence or a reality. The traditional loadout for the AR-15 is just at the limit where if you dump all of them, the gun doesn't implode. Right. It's right at its heat max. Yep. And then once you go past one extra mag, the gas tube or something will rupture. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of politics involved in that scandal i don't take it as any problem actual problem with the g36 um, i know the issued optics are not generally all that well liked mm. that integrated issue optic i can see that but that's really not an issue with the rifle that's the german military's decision and there are plenty of other like you can put on whatever you want you know why it's not liked it's freaking stacked optics stacked yeah. optics always <laughs> it's an idea it's an idea that's so bad we can't give up on it we just keep stacking optics so but you don't think this heat thing's a thing no the heat thing's definitely not if the guns were available in the U.S., I think they'd be fairly popular. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, you shot an XM8. I did. That's that essentially was, a G36. That was really nice. So it's the same gun, really. The, the, the XM8 is basically the same mechanism, but yeah. it's a bulkier gun. Like, yeah. There's more stuff, more volume to a, an XM8. Well, that's how you make it look like Starship Troopers. That's exactly true. Or a yeah. fish. Or a fish. Um, I, I regret not being able to shoot a G36 when I went to HK. Like, we, we had one day on the range, and we only had time for this many guns, and literally the G36 was the next one on the list that we had to cut because we 
didn't have time to get to it. Yeah. I figured I'd rather shoot an XM8 than a G36. No, I would agree. I'd rather shoot an MP7 than a G36. And the G36 will probably show up someday somewhere. Yeah, they they are around. Well, they're 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 they're, they're out there. They're they've been issued. And yeah, a so. lot of them to a lot of places. Yeah, totally. Uh, da da da. Kevin says, do you think the M1 Garand would have been better than the BAR for walking fire in World War I, given its lighter weight and quick reload, if mass, mass issued? Absolutely not. Eight rounds of, 20 rounds in the BAR isn't even enough for the attempt of using walking fire, and eight's even worse. And walking fire's dumb in the first place. Granted, granted. But let's, let's, let's just take the question under the idea that the walking fire could be used in some instance effectively. I think the eight-round capacity would have made it impossible to use yeah. viably. And actually, the weight of the BAR kind of brings it down. Yeah, you don't need it to be super light for walking fire. You need it to be holdable. Like, there are some guns that don't have a good way to... Like, there's a good front grip on the BAR, which is what you need. Well, that one you got it in the cup, too. Yeah. It's actually, it's not bad. Yeah. I would actually say the weight of the BAR made it better for that, not worse. Yeah. So, no, I would think that would the, the M1 would have been worse. E. Raja says, what weapon would you use as a Soviet soldier during World War II if you could choose no captured weapons? During World War II? Yes. So your options are going to be a Mosin the Gun, a 9130 long rifle, or an M44 carbine, maybe. Yep, of course. Uh, a PPSH 41 or 43 submachine gun. Yep. An SVT 40 yep. semi auto rifle. Mm -hmm. Or a sharp stick. I think that's about it. I'll tell you that what, what comes to mind would be it's one of the submachine guns for me. I don't know if I'd go with the 41 or the 43. The 41's got is a controllable gun which has a higher capacity drum, but a much higher rate of fire. Mm -hmm. um, and the magazines and drums are not really interchangeable, which is a problem. Yeah. Uh, the 43 was much better in terms of the manufacturing capabilities. I think those magazines are interchangeable. They totally are. So I'm, I'm inclined, even though I think the 41 might have brought more firepower to the table, my inclination is to say the PPS 43. I'm torn. The 43 is a better gun from all the sort of logistical reliability standpoints, but the 41 to me is a nicer gun, a, a better shooting gun. Like, you give me yeah, the two, I will have better results shooting with the 41, but that's not what it's all about. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that the 43, the magazines are always going to work, the gun's a lot lighter and a lot more compact for carrying around, mm -hmm. all that stuff matters. So, I don't know. So you'd go with a sub-gun, though? You wouldn't go with the SVT-40? Well, the Mosins are just yeah, right out the window. You're not even going to consider the Mosins. Uh, yeah, I think I'd probably take the subgun over the SVT. I'd rather have the firepower. Just, yeah, not not because of any problem with the SVT, just because I think I'd find the submachine gun more practical, more useful. I also think the submachine gun's more likely to save my ass when something goes awry. The SVT-40 is semi-automatic and not the most reliable. Eh, they're pretty good. Let's they're say it, let's big, say, let, but let's, okay, long. let's put this under the auspice that they're 100% reliable. Uh, I would still take the submachine gun because it's, it's got the ability to hit out to 100 yards. Yep. It does. Especially in that round, mm -hmm. 762 Tokarev is no slouch, mm -hmm. and you've got fully automatic capability, which is good for suppressive fire, and you've got interchangeable magazines and higher capacity. Um, Carry a lot more ammo on you too. That to me sounds like a life-saving thing. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I'd probably end up with the 43, for the same reasons, right? Yeah. 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 The 41 is alluring, but the 43 just is reliable. If it was just like pick it up and shoot that thing with it, I'd rather have the 41. But if it's you, this is going to be your gun for the next eight months, going everywhere? Probably the 43. Because with the 41, you're going to get one drum that fits that gun. Probably. You may not have a reload. Yep. You might dent that drum, and then, then you're in trouble until you can find another one that works. Yeah. Drums are a pain in the butt to carry. Yeah. Those stick mags are really nice. Yeah. So, so 43, I think yeah. we're on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Or an SKS. Well, that's right. No, actually, the end. that's the question. If you could have the SKS instead, because allegedly... They did see a little bit of use right in Berlin at the end. Now that you would bring you, up... Would you take an SKS over a PPS-43? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you're, now you're dealing with an intermediate cartridge. You've extended your range out to 200 yards or more. It's a much smaller gun. You've got 10 SVT. rounds on tap that's still were controllable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd go with the SKS, but I didn't even think about that because that was so at the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan. John Moses Browning or Eugene Stoner for greatest American firearm engineer? I think JMB brought more to the table in terms of a diversity of designs, but I think Eugene Stoner brought the most important gun to the table. Okay. Browning. Yeah. Browning is my choice far and away. Stoner was brilliant. Stoner designed some out absolutely outstanding guns, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. 
Browning designed categories of guns. I agree with that, but don't you think that what Stoner did brought the gun, brought Jam, Moses, okay, Browning brought a whole diverse, wide range of all sorts of mechanical designs to the table. He was a genius, no doubt about it. What Stoner did was brought guns to the table that have been become the practical, definitive answer to the problem, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah. Stoner did less diversity of designs, but the designs he brought had a greater impact. I don't think in so. In warfare over time. I don't know. We still use M2 heavy machine guns. Like, yeah. that's still, they haven't managed to replace that thing in 100 years. It's true. Stoner has one design yeah. that had that longevity. Now, he has more than that overall. Yeah. Like, the Stoner 63 is a magnificent, fascinating, fantastic gun. Mm -hmm, it is. But not one that would ended up being suitable for military use. Browning has, has so many guns that had that legacy. Yeah, he does. From lever actions to inventing the automatic shotgun to inventing the pistol slide. 1911s, the entire, in fact, every, virtually every modern semi-automatic handgun we use today is a Browning tilting barrel short recoil system. So the question says, greatest American firearm engineer. Yep. Yeah, it's Browning. It is Browning. Yep. Sto Stoner made a, some incredible impact, and, and, it, and his rifle has made an important thing for the U.S. military and the world. Yeah. But if you had to do it in aggregate, Browning has had a greater effect. Yeah. Christopher says, if you could go back in time and have one gun to receive the development that the AR-15 has received since its inception, which do you think would be the most interesting? Excluding the two that he apparently knows we think would be the most interesting, namely the AK and the FAMAS. Okay, I'm actually going with a pistol. It's not a, it's not a, it's not okay. a rifle, but he says a firearm, one yeah. gun. Yeah. I think the HK P7. Oh. The P7 oh. was a gun is a is a, is a, is a, is appreciated. People under, people today realize that the HK P7 is a fantastic pistol, mm -hmm. but it's a fantastic pistol that had a brief lifespan, and it still continues to be a fantastic pistol, although it's somewhat obsolescent because of age and time. I think the design itself had so much merit that it should have been continued, and I think that if we continued the HK P7 for all the years that it could have been developed, I think we would have an incredibly interesting pistol today. That's a very interesting choice. Okay. I would say the Pedersen rifle. Oh, okay. Toggle lock. Mm -hmm. It is. While the lock itself has some pretty close tolerances mm -hmm. for machining sake, it's a very simple gun. Doesn't recoil. Doesn't? Shit. Now I have to think about that. Doesn't recoil. Doesn't have no. I mean, it doesn't have a recoil-based action. I think it does. It doesn't. Shit. Doesn't matter. Continue to ask a question. This is okay. You don't know everything either. <laughs> I'm supposed to. <laughs> damn it! I'm supposed to know everything. We've revealed the truth. All right. There are some toggle locks out there, and they didn't last all that long. Other stuff that didn't last long didn't last for very good reasons, like long recoil. Yes. 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 Like, yes. There are advantages to long recoil, but the disadvantages clearly outweigh them, and no amount of engineering. Or, in, or you know, iteration is going to solve it. The toggle locks might have, there's, there's like a potential there. It'd be very interesting to see, had the U.S. adopted the Pedersen instead of the M1, mm -hmm. where would that have led us by the time of, say, the M14? Give them 20 years to work on that design. Yeah. It is a potentially extremely simple and reliable system. The downside being, it's like you have to make it really well. But, you know, we're good at making things really well. Well, the toggle lock, I mean, the whole thing is a concept of a knee joint. Right. Right? And you, when you think of guns that used a knee joint concept for locking, the Luger. Yeah. The Henry. Yeah. The, all the Winchesters. Yeah. Uh, the, the Maxims. The Maxim. And this rifle you're referring yeah. to. What else? That's about it. That's pretty much it. Oh, maybe the Chris. No, that's blowback. Does it's, it have, oh, but no. it has a toggle lock, the laying thing. No. Oh, no, the spring, it looks like a knee joint. It, yeah, but it, you're right. It goes blowback. down. It's Regardless, blowback. so we've got the Luger, the Maxim. Um, there are a few other weird. The ones. Winchesters, the Pedersen. Walther made a semi-auto shotgun with a toggle lock. Oh. Um, there's a weird Schwarzlosa 1901 has a toggle lock. But if you think about it, some of the gun like these are some pretty iconic guns. Oh yeah. The Maxim, the Winchesters, for Maxim, sure. the entire Winchester series, and the Luger. Like, yeah. That's, you know, there's, there's clearly at least a little bit of potential there. I mean, the Winchesters were the AR-15s of their day. Yeah. And, and, and still to this day are incredible guns. Yeah. But I think semi-auto toggle locking, hmm. there's, that All would right. be interesting. So you're going with semi-auto toggle lock and the, and the guys of the Pedersen, and I'm going with the HKP-7. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good set of Those answers. are both good answers, yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Ian, a different Ian, 
says, with the trend of modern optics, optics, do you think we will see a time where handguns and rifles have no iron sights? Yeah, absolutely. We already have in some places. Yeah, totally. Um, not so much with handguns, but it's not difficult to find pictures of especially special forces type guys who have optics and no iron sights on their rifles today. Whether, whether they're red dots or even EOTEX or whatever or variables, there's the reality is that's a comp, that's, that, that's, that's a choice that some people are making. The vast majority of hunting rifles do not have iron sights on them anymore. Yeah, I think we're talking military here. Well, yes um, and no. Yeah. When it comes to a pistol, I want to say this. I think this is something that's misunderstood sometimes. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the backup, backup iron sights on a red dot sighted pistol matter more than backup irons on yeah. a rifle or long arm. The reason for that isn't because your red dot's going to fail, it's because what you can do is use the pistol, because you only have one point of contact or two with your hands holding the pistol. When you bring the pistol up to aim, those two, those iron sights are quicker to acquire, and then you can align the pistol and do a handoff from the irons to the dot. Right. Now you can have enough iterations where eventually this becomes sort of intuitive, but when you're in a dynamic situation or you're using the gun one-handed or in some awkward position, using the irons to get to the red dot matters. Yeah. When you're using a long arm, which has all the extra points of contact, you do not need the irons to be able to find the dot. Right. So I would say on a pistol, they matter more on a rifle. I'm, I think you're going to see more and more oh. iron sights completely excluded or mm, we threw these in in an afterthought where they're just kind of there and if you need them, you can flip them up, but you, they're never going to get used. You already see that, like, for example, in the Tavor. They included irons, but those irons are kind of just, they're not great, yeah. and they're just folded in, and they're like flip-up leaf with a little hole and a post, yeah. and how, and because it's, it's getting to the point of being not necessary. Yeah. Andy Echo has a repeat question. Why do you think it is that bolt-action rifles and pump-action shotguns became the norm, and the inverse, bolt-action shotguns and pump-action rifles, are kind of weird? I can't action, I cannot answer bolt action shotgun, and maybe you can answer this, but what I can tell you is personal experience. Um, pump action anything requires a very deliberate motion to make sure you don't short stroke or cause or induce a malfunction. Mm -hmm. We see that with shotguns, heck, if you watch the shotgun videos from Halloween on this channel, you're going to see that happening quite a few times to a lot of people. But what I do know is I have tried to use, in cowboy action particularly, the Colt Lightning, which is a mm -hmm. pump action that was supposed to be a competitor to the lever guns because Colt and Winchester actually had a gentleman's agreement where Colt would not compete with them with lever guns. Right. And so what they did is they came out with a pump gun as an alternative. I have not once, and I mean really once, ever seen a pump action lightning, whether it's a reproduction or an original, ever be reliable. <laughs> I don't know why, but I've never seen it work. Never. <laughs> so there's something there, and I don't know what it is, whether it was the design itself or just something about the idea. Never seen one work well. This isn't a question I have had a chance to put a lot of thought into, but my initial gut feeling is that bolt action rifles tend to be, or bolt action tends to be better for higher pressure cartridges. You have a more positive um, locking system. Like, you know absolutely when it's locked and when it's not. Sure. Um, if you look at the locking systems on pump action designs, they're typically like a little vertical traveling plug that's not as strong as a two lug rotating bolt. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to introduce a rotating bolt into a pump action is a little, mechanically, a little more tricky. And unnecessary. Yeah. Well, and then with the, the pump action shotguns, my gut feeling is it's more about the magazine than the action. A shotgun shell is a big cartridge with mm. a perfectly flat face and a protruding rim. Mm. And they're very difficult to get to work in box magazines. There are a wow. few and in fact, the few box magazine shotguns are often bolt action. Um, was it Stevens, I think? Mm. You've, I'm sure you've seen them at gun shows. The bolt action shotguns that hold like three rounds in a stick magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Germans had one too. They had a bolt action shotgun at some point. Wasn't there some commercial one? Yeah, there was com uh, conversions of Mausers. Yeah, that's right. But I'm thinking purpose built sporting. Okay, fair enough. The thing is, when you put shotgun shells in a tube magazine, they work great. Tube magazine, I suspect, is a little more conducive to the pump action system. Because of the rim. Yeah. Now, it's right. interesting. That the, the rim and the flat face. The counter that's going to come to this is then, why did we not see more lever action shotguns? Uh, shotgun rounds are too long. Well, the 1887 exists. Yeah. This is another one. And by the way, this is interesting. Um, just like the pump action lightning, those 1887 lever guns, the reproductions are bad in general. They have to be completely fixed to make them work at all. Um, but even the originals, they're clunky. Yeah. 
they're really clunky. There's something about the throw and the length of the throw in the lever gun, even when it's reliable to get that. Yeah. And it's still a tube-fed magazine because mm -hmm. of the rims and all the things that come with that. So it's just maybe the, the general dynamics of the cartridge and the ergonomics associated with it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on because I don't have anything better for that one. I don't know if that was a good answer. Uh, that definitely a question that deserves a better answer. Yeah, there's, that's an in-depth kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Brian says, what is the best value in home-built part kits available today? Set me slash G3, set me L, Uzi, still the AK. He would love to see another video build series. Well, there won't be another video build series on YouTube. There will not. Because they do not allow that anymore. Um, to my mind, there aren't any good values in home-built parts kits mm -hmm. because they don't come with barrels. Um, yeah. The heyday of home builds was when you could get a kit with a complete barrel, and all you had to supply was a receiver and semi-auto fire control parts. Um, and especially, you know, there was a period when AK kits were under hundred bucks, mm -hmm. fifty to hundred bucks for a kit with what was often, depending on the, you know, the nationality of the kit, often a brand new barrel. Like I remember getting a bunch of Romanian kits where there was still a little piece of wax paper in the barrel from when it was refurbed and put into storage. Wow, that's cool. And you could put like 200 bucks total. Like if you bought a brand new fire control part set, complete 100% built receiver, you could be into an AK for like 200, 250 bucks. That was that. That was when home building made economic sense. Today, you've got kits but you don't have barrels anymore, mm -hmm. so you have to go buy a new barrel, and then that means you have to do a lot more work. You have to headspace the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Um, you have to drill the, the barrel pin hole in the barrel. You have to you know drill the pin slots, the pin holes, uh, for your gas block, for your front sight block. Headspacing is an important point, because when you got those kits with the barrel, it was already done. Exactly. You had a matching kit, the yeah. bolt, the barrel, the trying, it, headspace was... It was, more, it was more of just assembly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was assembly, but still harder than an AR. Oh, oh yeah. An AR well, is AR, just yeah. Legos. AR is Legos. Um, yeah. Building an AK was absolutely gunsmithing. So was the Setme. Yeah, the Setme was harder, too, though. The, yeah. the welding made it harder. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, semi-auto submachine guns, like building a semi-auto sub gun out of a parts kit has always been quite difficult. Virtually all of those have to be converted from open bolt to closed bolt, mm. and that's a, a tricky process. It is. You know, that's, that's not introductory level gunsmithing. That's some fairly advanced stuff. Um, you know, this. I look at Set Me and G3 kits today, and there's no barrel, and there's no receiver, and just... Uh, so you're saying the, the days of home builds are done? I think they are. I think, well, I think they are in terms of cost. Like, there are two reasons to home build a parts kit. One is because it's cheaper than buying the, the thing already assembled. Mm. Like, that's the true surplus sort of incentive. Yes. The other is because you enjoy gunsmithing and mechanics and fabrication, and you want to do this because it's cool to start with this bag of torch-welded crap and end with a gun that works. And in that, you know, for that, we still have a pretty good situation. Yeah. The supply of kits is not what it used to be. No. There used to be more variety in just cool, different, interesting kits. That's used the case with all surplus, not even mind firearms kits. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, used to have... You could get PPSH kits, you could get PPS-43 kits, you could get Uzi kits. There's still some Uzis out there. You could get, like, there were commando kits, South African commando subguns around. Um, boy, what else? Uh, it was everything to a yeah, degree. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. There, DP-28s. Yeah, it's almost hard, it's almost easier to count the guns that didn't show up as parts kits. Yeah, yeah. Like Stetchkins. Hmm. I've seen one or two. They were never, like, bulk Stetchkin parts kits. But so much else there was. Hmm? PM63s. Yeah. Um, the Finnish guns, KP44s, Suomi M31s. Oh, yeah. Those the Suomi, I remember that. Place. I remember that. Um, yeah. Light machine guns. Yeah. DPs. Uh, I had a Madsen Seder kit for a while. Holy crap, that was weird. Heck, there's even um, MG40, MG42s and 34s. Oh, yeah. 42s, 34s, yeah. PKMs were around. Yeah. Goryanovs. Um, yeah. So I guess the reason to do that now would be because you are really truly interested in the mechanical capabilities of how this thing works, yeah. and there's no real better way to really intimately understand and learn that except by building it. Yeah, and it's, it's legitimately really awesome to start with a pile of parts and actually build a thing that works. And then when it runs, is a really there is a sense of satisfaction in doing something well. Yeah, and frustration when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, that's what you have eight millimeter label cases for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. 
what's the best value in them? Probably Val still. I don't think, if you're assessing it by value, I think you're looking at it wrong. What you have to do is say, what gun do I think is the coolest that I can find a kit for? Yeah. I want this thing that I couldn't buy otherwise, and the only way to do it is to build it. If you want to build a uh, ZB-37 kit, I think Centerfire still has some of those things getting pretty cheap, because nobody wants to deal with them. Wow. Um, and because the fortress mounts weigh like 100 pounds, and no one wants to pay shipping on that. Sure. And so the barrel shroud weighs like 40 pounds, and no one wants to pay shipping on that. Either. But in summary, there was a heyday for this, and it's over. Yeah. Yep. David says, Carl, an update on your Beretta 92 and Walther CCP. Any thoughts on upgrading your Beretta for competition use? I have no updates besides that both guns have worked reliably and consistently with no issues whatsoever. Um, the Beretta 92, I did do one thing on, which I changed to a G model decock. Okay. Uh, it originally had the standard 92 safety on it, and I was accidentally engaging the safety while manipulating the slide. Happened mm -hmm. to me a number of times, and that G model decocker is a huge, huge benefit and upgrade to the Beretta in general. Um, in terms of upgrading the Beretta for competition use, that's not my game. I'm going to use it the way it is. Putting the G model decock got rid of a problem that caused me literally uh, click no boom, which I don't want. But other than that, that's about as competitive I'm going to get with it. Both guns have been consistently reliable. Accurate and excellent. So I still like them both. Garrett says, favorite piece of classic or vintage gear? The M1 Garand cartridge belt. Ooh. That thing is awesome. That's like the only piece of World War One kit <laughs> that's legitimately <laughs> fast and excellent. Well, you said Garand, but that's not World War One, but it's the same belt from World War One and World War Two. Yes. I mean, they essentially yeah, the same belt. It is the same belt. Oh. Um, it's better with the Garand because you have one clip per pocket. With the Springfield, there were some that had a separate, like an extra little button flap yep. to hold the second clip in. Yep. The classic problem with cartridge po pouches like that is you open it, you grab one clip, load it in the rifle, and then you jump up and run somewhere and the other one or two clips go bloop and fall out. Which is, we've seen that in our matches. With, with over and over, like, predictable. Stunning reliability. Yeah. Open pouch, pull out one cart, one stripper clip, feed the gun, run to the next position, you lose three of them on the field. Yeah. And you must you take the time to close and latch it which nobody ever does. There must be an amazing amount of loaded stripper clips laying over the Eastern Front and all over the World War I battlefields, because that yeah. must have happened to dudes in the field. Yeah. Had to have. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting answer. So your, your, yours is that, is that belt. Like, today, if I want to go to a match with an M1, as long as I can hook the rest of my stuff to that belt, I'm set. I do not need any more modern piece of kit than that belt. It protects the cartridges, it pr or protects the, the clips. Mm. Uh, it's fast to get to. That pull-the-dot thing is... It's the right balance of protection and accessibility for me. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, you know, I don't know if this is going far enough back to classic vintage web gear, but I'm going to go ahead and go with the World War II M1 Garand web sling. Because hmm. that sling is still dynamically changeable for length. All you do is... And you can use it as a loop sling or as a hasty sling. And it works on almost any gun you put it on. Okay. So, interestingly, we're both picking M1 Garand-related items. Um, Must have been a good rifle. It was. <laughs> Still is. Uh, Roy says, bolt-action rifles are obsolete, but is an SMG effective in a modern context? You know, I, 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 I threw this question in there because I found this to be compelling. Because when, when the intermediate cartridge assault rifle, for lack of a better term, became the thing. Mm -hmm. SMGs fell off the radar for most people. For a lot of uses, yeah. And I don't, I, 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 this is a question I think, I'm, I'm refer, rephrasing this question maybe towards you, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Did we, did, was in that rush to the intermediate cartridge assault rifle, did it neglect the advantages that the SMG still potentially has? I don't know that it neglected them. I, I think it's important to recognize that there are some advantages to the yeah. submachine gun. Um, it is more controllable in full auto, and it has like, a lot less blast and concussion, mm -hmm. and that can matter. Yeah. That can absolutely matter, um, especially if you throw a suppressor on. Your 9mm subgun can become effectively ear safe because it's easy to get 9mm subsonic ammunition. Absolutely. If, you're, if you're using a 45 caliber submachine gun, done. It is subsonic. Uh, if you're using something like a, a short-barreled carbine, you're going to have to go to, like, specially loaded 300 blackout mm -hmm. to get a subsonic round and in many ways like suppressing a supersonic rifle still has its its rationale oh yeah but it's not the same as suppressing a subsonic one and having something that is truly hearing safe without any ear protection um, 
And that matters in a tactical context too, because if you're, the more ear protection you're wearing, the harder it is to communicate with people. I suppose you can get around that by having radio, you know, integrated into your hearing protection. Mm. But listening to what's going on in the environment, listening to other people who might be there, who might not be linked into your radio system. Um, if I'm in a building and a SWAT team's coming in, I would rather them be able to hear everything that's going on. Yep. Not just that. When you when you suppress a sup uh, an intermediate cartridge like 5.56 and you're not going subsonic, the reason for suppressing that isn't for hearing safe or to be able to still ascertain the audio around you. It's to it's a tactical thing in that it's hard for the person being fired at to ascertain where the gunshots are being fired from. When you when you suppress a submachine gun with let's say 147 grain or 158 grade subsonic 9 millimeter, you've heard this. Mm -hmm. um, it is so quiet that the bullets hitting the dirt is louder than the gun. Yeah. Like you can hear the bullets going funk, 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 funk. It can funk. be. It depends on your suppressor, but yeah. With mine, when I suppress my submachine gun with mm -hmm. subsonics, the bullets hitting the, the berm are louder than the gun. That you can hear them thumping into the ground. I think that that's something you're not going to do with any M4 carbine. No, you're not. And therefore, there is a place and purpose in which the submachine gun still has an application, especially for an insertion team or SWAT team or inside close quarters or CQB. Yeah. And I think... Personally, I think we're going to. I think we saw this already to some degree. Everybody ditched the submachine guns, and then some people went, "Oh, maybe not. We want our MP7 back, or 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 even MP5s, or, or, or P90, or MP5, <laughs> or poor HK trying to sell UMPs." And everyone goes, "No, no, no, no. We just we want the MP5. But just keep making the MP5. But 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 <laughs> but 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 I think that I don't think I don't. I know we're now we love this word obsolete on in range at this point, but yes, I don't I, d I don't think yeah, but I don't think submachine guns are obsolete. No, I agree. Yeah. Uh, John says, what has been more practical, a slick plate carrier with a chest rig on top or a combination rig? I have a lot of combination stuff, but I think what's actually it depends on your needs, doesn't it? What? No. Gosh darn it. We need an absolute answer. This really depends. Like like, like let's say if like, okay, you've got your M4 and your M9 and that's all you're ever going to use, then the combination rig makes sense because it's already rigged up for your particular weapon systems. Mm -hmm. For people like you and I, in which we're constantly changing stuff up, a slick rig that we can then throw stuff on top of makes more sense. Or something like you saw what Varus Delake is doing, or others in which you can like zip or unlatch or then tear or J-hook and then tear it off and put another one on. I'm torn on that. Well, I do not have the experience to make a choice on this. Yeah. To, to really comment on it, but my gut feeling is I would rather have a combination. I would yeah. rather have fewer separate layers going on. Yeah. So. The, 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 the benefit of the slick carrier is that you can wear it without anything on it, too. I do like the idea of a slick carrier and a belt rig. Hmm. That's something that you can like. do. That I like more than the idea of a slick plate carrier with a chest rig on top. You know what? I think the right answer to this is that neither is more practical. It completely depends on what you need to do. Yeah. I think it matters. I think it's it's it's. I don't think I, I don't think we can say either one. Joseph, did you really throw away your CZ fifty two fifty seven at Red October? Of course. Next question. No, he got it back out of the trash can. Yeah, we dug. We we tra uh, we dumpster dove and got it out. In fact, we checked that dumpster before throwing the gun in to see what exactly we were throwing the gun into. Which was a bunch of boxes. And it was like, yeah, it was like, yeah, it was actually um, plastic bags and full some, of basically empty cartridge boxes from the range trash cans. Which so meant was, that when I threw it in there, it wasn't going to hurt it. And <laughs> I subsequently bought a completely intact, all brand new bolt, all all of it, firing pin, all of it. I bought an entire bolt from Apex, mm -hmm. dropped it in there, and the gun runs again. Yeah. So. No, we did not actually. Until it breaks the next time. Well, it, it will because it's a terrible design, but the gun is running again. Uh, John says, given the number of weapons you, and particularly Ian, have lying around and borrow for videos, how many calibers of ammo do you have lying around? Which ammo gave you the most headache to source? And why is it 44 Evans? He didn't say that. I just he didn't that. say that, 44 Evans, but that's a good one. The actually, 42 Evans. Um, well, I mean, you've got a lot of weird ammunition around. I do. Yeah. yeah. I have more than you do. Probably. Because, um, well, you've got a lot of guns. A lot of them are kind of standardized calibers. Yeah, I do. I've, you know, I guess the weirdest stuff for me would be Old West stuff. Yeah. I have more Old West weird cartridges than you do. Yeah. 45 short Henry. No, I've got 45. Well, I've got 45. I mean, this doesn't sound that weird, but it is weird by most people's standards. Like 45 Schofield or 45 Smith & Wesson. Got that. We've got now, God, I've just been reloading a ton of 4560 yep. from converted 4570 brass for us to shoot an 1876 Winchester. And so I, I'm going to say that for most people, having a whole bunch, having a couple hundred rounds of 4560 laying around would be an unusual yes. circumstance. So I would say that if you're looking at cartridges from the 1880s, I have a lot of weird stuff. 
Um, in terms to modern cartridges, I don't have a lot of weird stuff. It's more standards. The ammunition that has been the hardest for me to source has been 4.7 millimeter caseless for the G11. Well, yeah. And I have eight rounds of it that I did manage to get. I have not yet managed to put that ammo in the same place as a functional G11. The G11 at the Grey Room, I, am, I was told, was not fireable. Can't combine the two. Not yet. So I know there are some fireable G11s in Europe, but like I'd have to get my ammo over there. And let's be honest, eight rounds. Gotta is, go fast. Gotta go really to, fast. The thing you're gonna look at on the G11 is that three round burst. Boop. And and so yeah, it's like bang, bang, and now I'm out of ammo. You're gonna get two and two thirds of those. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> as much as I would love to get to shoot one, and yeah. I would, the yeah, video, if I ever do, is gonna be kind of boring. Yeah, nothing's going on. Nothing happens. Like slow motion video of a G11 is bullets leave and that's it. Yep. There's no casing. Yep, yep. There's no moving part of any sort that you can see on the outside. You've also had a hell of a time getting ammunition for your French submachine gun. Well, yeah, I still don't have that working. So that's, no, but I mean, in I terms just, of answering this question, yeah, that's, that's been a severe problem. That's, and, and that's the more practical one. 765 French long. Yeah. Um, a big thanks to Cameron out there who has been hand-loading me batches one at a time that I've been trying out. Uh, but I don't have one that works yet. Yeah. I'm starting to wonder if there's maybe more wrong with the gun. I don't, um, I don't know. But I don't actually have yet quite a perfect representation, reproduction of the original ammo. The problem is the bullet that was used in the original ammo doesn't quite match anything that's common today. Mm. It's a 30 caliber bullet, but like 95 grains. So it's heavier than most of what's out there. It was originally kind of a long pointed bullet. I was thinking. I was thinking you might. I said earlier today you might want to use 110 grain 30 carbine bullets. That might be the next thing. And just seat them deep. Yeah. Yeah. That's heavier than the spec calls for, but it might better. Might work better. But we've also. I've also been tasked occasionally with making some weird stuff like 42 Evans. Yeah. Which find dies for that. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> um, so like literally a combination of multiple different die sets set to different settings to make like a couple rounds. Yeah. Which, by the way, don't do that at home unless you really know what you're doing with reloading because that's dangerous behavior. Yeah. Uh, Tim says, would you all consider a project to modernize the M1 carbine as a sort of small jungle gun? The only thing I do with an M1 carbine is sell it because I don't want to deal with those guns ever in my life. Um, I think that's a place where you can just replace it with an AR carbine. Yeah. And get basically the same weight, all of the capacity or, or all the capability that you're looking for with a modernized M1 carbine but without the problems. Like, the engineering has already been done to make it reliable, to make the magazines good. What does the M1 carbine bring to the table that you really need or want? Four and a half pounds. Okay. I think, honestly, it is primarily, it is such a small and handy gun. You do that with a what would stoner do carbine, you're at, you're, you're almost, you're close, Pretty and you're shooting 5.56 five, five, with a gun that's reliable. And optics. And shoots sub MOA. And has optics. Yeah. And you can put a bipod on it if you want. This is gonna infuriate the audience, I wanna go ahead and say it. Um, some people in the audience. M1 carbines are obsolete. No, well, <laughs> yeah, but that wasn't where I was going to go. The, the, the truth is, and this is legit, I, this is no doubt in my mind, I've had such bad experience with M1 carbines over and over and over again. Like, decades of bad experience with M1 carbines. Um, I have given up on that platform, and if you had on a table an M1 carbine and an 1866 lever gun, I would take the lever gun without hesitation <laughs> because it will run every time I run the lever and fire. I, I just don't trust those guns. I don't. I've never seen one make it through a match. I've never seen one that was either my... I, I've never had one that worked, and I've never seen one work. All right. Not reliable enough by my standards. I'm, I know they exist. We're going to hear in the comments about how theirs does. Yes. Have you seen one work? Like, to, to the standards no, that work? No, not to 100% standard. No. I don't know. Uh, Ryan says, if you had access to a C-93 Borchardt and an early Madsen semi-auto rifle, would you run a two-gun match with them? Of course. Sure. Yeah, I'll run a two-gun match with anything, pretty yeah. much, that we can get through the match with. We need 8x58 uh, Danish hmm. ammo, probably. We're going to need a handful of C93 magazines, as well as 7.63 Borchardt. Um, but if we had that stuff, those sure. two guns are actually capable of getting through the course of fire. Yes. Yes, they are. That's the yeah. challenge. It's like, I don't ever want to bring a gun that can't even make it through the course of fire. So when you get a question like, would you run a two-gun match with an 1861 Springfield rifled musket and an 1861 Colt? No. No, because there's no possible way to get through one stage even once. Yeah. But with that, yeah, that'd do it. Could do it. If you have these two, please contact us, me, 
And um, yeah, I'll totally do it. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> a boar shard. Imperator314 says, what are your opinions or preferences regarding AR-15 lubrication? I prefer to run mine very wet. Mm. However, I'm in the army and uh, they always say to use very little lubrication because it attracts dirt and sand. I'm skeptical. What gives? I'm in the latter camp. I think, th now here's the thing. So many of the AR-15s, or I should say uh, M16s, M4s that are in U.S. military stock have not been properly maintained for like ever. And so there are lots of things that go on with military guns that would not happen with a properly maintained rifle or carbine. And a properly maintained M4 or a properly maintained M16 A2 or A1 or any of those, meaning properly maintained, should only require a very small amount of lubricant on the contacting parts of the bolt carrier group and the bolt. Mm -hmm. And that any more than that is a dirt attractant. That said, running them wet will compensate for some of the tomfoolery and lack of maintenance that has gone on with military rifles. So your mileage may vary, but a properly running AR should not have to be run wet. How's that? Sounds good to me. Like our what would stunner do's. Frankly, you were running yours dry. I, I'm trying to remember when I last lubricated it. I'm not sure. It's not because what would stunner, not, not because our builds are like some magical thing. It's because they're just well maintained, made out of good parts, and they haven't been run into the ground. Yeah. Jeremy says, why do you think, oh, this is a good one. Why do you think a device similar in concept to the Pedersen device wasn't further pursued interwar? Many countries tried to, uh, tried to convert their obsolete bolt guns into semi-autos to no avail, and it seems the Pedersen device could have been improved and solved a lot of the issues. You're going to know more about this than I, but my understanding is the Pedersen device didn't work in the first place. Number one, it didn't work in the first place. Yeah, okay. Number two, the money it would take to make it work and then manufacture those and use them is more than it would take to just develop and use a proper semi-auto, natively semi-auto rifle. Yep. And three... The best way I heard this described was Othias at CN Arsenal, who yeah. described it as John Pedersen built a pistol caliber carbine inside the footprint of a Springfield 1903 bolt. Yes, he did. Holy crap. That, that is a technical challenge. That is what he did. Yes. But what you've ultimately done is created a long arm that was firing 30 out 6 and turned it into 32 ACP. Yeah, a 9 millimeter, 4 foot long, 32 ACP PCC. Literally pew pew. I mean, there's not a lot of potency there. Great for suppressing a bit. <laughs> Any bullet coming your way is a bad thing. But, I mean, when you're talking about war, 32 ACP being fired out of that semi-automatic is not exactly impressive. Yeah. Um, build a submachine gun. Yeah. That would be way cheaper than trying to convert bolt rifles to pistol caliber cartridges. Um, and apparently the U.S. did some testing. Um, and, again, Othias and uh, mm -hmm. Andrew at Archival Research Group are responsible for finding this. Um, the U.S. actually went back and did some testing on the Pedersen devices after the war yes. in the early 20s. And yeah, they're yeah. like, holy cow, these things are actually crap. <laughs> <laughs> they don't work at all. <laughs> we almost did this. Wow. Oh, my Boy, gosh. I'm glad we out. didn't do this. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Martin says, 4K video when? This goes for Forgotten Weapons as well. As far as I'm concerned, never. Um, I mean, obviously someday. But the reality is 1080p is where it is. And 1080p is already, for me at least, file size is larger than I like to deal with. These generates huge files, and there's a lot of effort and time to upload huge files, especially when InRange is decentralized, and yeah. I've got to upload it to multiple destinations. This is part of why we're not on Pornhub anymore. It, well, it's part of, well, we're still there, well, but we're not uploading to yeah. it because the views aren't there. We're consistently, we're still, we are still decentralized, and I publish the content to multiple different distribution networks, Full30, Facebook, YouTube, BitChute, but each one of those I add is another, oh my gosh, multiple gigs of uploads, yeah. and it has to be done, and then you find out you made a, a typo in a video, and you got to do it all over again. So, um, and, let's be realistic, I think the majority, or a lot of the audience, watches this on a phone. Phone. It's about this big. The reality is, is that I've tried this. Now, maybe your eyes are better than mine, but I have pretty decent vision. I've looked at 480 video on my phone, and I've looked at 1080p on my phone, and I can't barely tell the difference. But if it doesn't say HD, people complain. So there's going to be a point where people are going to say it doesn't say 4K, and there's going to be a complaint, even though I don't know that it's perceptible. Yeah. There are a few people out there watching on some monstrous oh, 4K screen. Totally, totally. And I but, understand that then. But the majority aren't. What are yeah. you saying about what do you think about Forgotten Weapons? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Honestly, at this point, I've used, I have not changed cameras since, I think, 2013. Wow. With the exception that I, I had to repair the camera once because I tripped and threw it on the floor and it broke. Um, so, you know, if it's repaired, is it still the same camera? But it's the same model of camera and it works great. And I probably, I suspect I will go to 4K 
when something forces me to replace and upgrade that camera. I'll deal with 4K when it becomes an issue that the audience dictates it to the you know, point where they don't want to watch anymore because of it. At some point, we may also get to the point where cameras offer native high speed yeah. that's good enough to really offer a substantial improvement in, at the same time that they also offer 4K. Yeah, sure. And that's that would be more compelling. Yeah. For what we do, I don't see a whole lot of necessity for 4K. Like, I don't... Yeah, it'll look crisper, but you're not going to actually gain any objective anything from it, I don't think. Nah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to perceive. I mean, there's audio and video files out there, and I'm sure that... I'm assuming that Martin's one of those by asking the question. I'm not trying to denigrate your interest in better quality video. I'm not. But it is a huge overhead and burden on the content producer in terms of getting that stuff up on the net. Yeah. So And storing it. A video every day archive, quadrupling the size of those. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah, that's another thing. thing. Just, you try to archive your files when you're done in case something happens. And uh, that's another thing is storing all that stuff forever. Yeah. I mean, 1080p is okay right now, and someday it will be 4K, but only when it becomes essential. Yeah. Uh, Bobby says, are you seeing ARs with AR pistols with braces at matches more and more? I wouldn't say more and more. We see them once in a while. Yeah, occasionally. Yeah, two-gun match, they show up. Actually, you know what? I think it's pretty regular now that we'll see at least one or two at a two-gun match. Yeah. There are a couple guys who've decided, that's my thing, mm-hmm. I like it. Um, you won't see it at a three-gun match, because those guns aren't for that. Wasn't there, I thought I saw uh, a note come out from one of the matches that they specifically do not allow them. What was that? I don't know. It's not It's not too gack me. No, it, it definitely isn't. Yeah. I can't remember. I thought there was one that I saw that, that made that policy because they didn't want to be associated with any potential liability down the line. I don't see it. That's weird. As a match director, unless something is obviously illegal, I, yeah. it's kind of on you. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, how do I know? Never mind a pistol brace. How do I know the rifle you're using you didn't steal? <laughs> what if it's a stolen gun? I mean, I, I'm, obviously I'm making a hypothesis here, but maybe you're at the match with a stolen rifle. Hopefully you're not one of those people, but I'm not going to go find out if that's a stolen gun or not so you can right. shoot the match. And the pistol brace thing is like, it's on you. It's not on me. <laughs> if so, the cops show up and arrest you, that's your problem. It's not my problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kyle says, what is the best dual purpose, purpose cartridge for cowboy action shooting? I'm getting a Henry Big Boy with my taxes, and I need some ideas uh, for a round that would pair well with a revolver, but would also come in handy if I'm out in the brush. Not to poo-poo your choice, but I wouldn't go with a Henry Big Boy. Um, if you're going to do cowboy action shooting, I would look at the Uberti or Cimarron stuff, which is all Italian, and I'd look at the 73. Um, it's a faster, smoother action than the big boy is. No offense to Henry, but if you're going cowboy action shooting, you're going to be better off with a 73 with that Winchester toggle link system. Um, for cowboy action shooting, um, you know, it depends on if you're a purist or not, but since she's asking dual purpose, go with a 1873 Winchester and a chambered in 357 Magnum, and then at cowboy action shooting, shoot 38 specials. That's or, or shoot 38 special loads, and the reason you can do that is then you have no recoil at the cowboy match. But when you want to use the gun for something more practical, you can pop it up into 357s, and a 357 Magnum out of a rifle is no slouch. Yeah. That's what I would do. The opposite side of this, I figured you were going to go with the historical side, and then mm. I chimed in. He said dual purpose, so I'm providing the dual purpose. If you want to be the cool, authentic, historical guy, you want 4440. Yeah, because there were no 45 Colt lever guns at the time. So um, the reason why this is gets, this is, gets deep, but the reason 45 Colt was never chambered in lever guns back in the day is because the original 45 Colt was a balloon head cartridge with almost no rim, and therefore it would not properly extract out of a chamber with a lever gun. Um, so what happened was lever guns were 44-40 or 44 Henry Rimfire, which is a unicorn now, and pistols would have been either in 45 Colt or 44-40 or 38-40 or something like that. But if you want dual purpose pistol and rifle and you want to be historically accurate, absolutely 44-40. If you're looking for dual purpose in terms of a gun you want to use at cowboy action but then also go hunting with or whatever, uh, a 1873 in 38-357 is the winner. All right. Uh, Stuka, 444, says, Why did the French never adopt larger magazines for their battle rifles, despite all other nations having what seems like a 20-round magazine minimum? I had to say, I threw this in there because it said French, and (laughs) and, and it's a question I have troubled myself with. I look at the French guns, you know, go back to World War I, they're like the three-round... What? Like, no, like, 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 what? Like, well, so there is a good explanation for that. What is it? It's a cavalry carbine. It was never meant to be anything more than a cavalry carbine. And they went from one round to three, 
and three was slick. This was 1890. This was before, this actually predates the Carabiner um, 88. Pretty much everyone, you know, the German cavalry at this time was using uh, Mauser 71s. All right. All right. All right. They didn't have a carbine version of the 7184. Okay. The, the issue here, what you're saying is, why on earth did they have, like, full-length battle rifles in World War One with three-round clips? Yeah. And the answer is because that gun was never intended to be an infantry rifle. Only reason it became one is because when World War One started, they weren't making labels anymore. And the label, by the way, had an 8 plus 1 Yeah, no, capacity, it did. It did. It did. Which was the biggest thing out there. It was. Eh, except the SMLEs. But, it, it was. Um they needed to start producing rifles right now and the berthier was cheaper and more accessible than the label and with three rounds that's what they had it's better than a pointy stick yes okay so why did this so, continue to be a french tradition though um so the original semi-auto was the moss 1940 which was in trials it got cut off in trials by the end by the armistice in 1940 yep and it had a fixed five round magazine didn't have detachable magazines at all 1940. 1940, that's okay. That's not yeah. really out of the realm. We look at the German G41, that's a 10-round fixed box magazine. Yeah. The M1 Garin's an 8-round N-block magazine. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or um, N-block, not N-block, excuse me, N-block clip. Yeah. Not a magazine. What they did, when they put that gun into production right after the war as the Moss 44, they realized, all right, this, we need a detachable, larger capacity magazine. And they kind of just quickly dashed off a 10 rounder mm. this by the way is why that magazine has the spring clip on the side mm -hmm. because they had already they didn't want to change up the receiver to add a oh, magazine release so they like, modify the mag. we've got all the tooling we've tested it we know it's good we just want to change to a detachable mag so we'll put a spring clip on the mag oh and then i the, didn't realize that yeah, then the gun state like we don't have to redo any of the work on the gun i suspect um it was one of those bureaucratic things that, like Ten rounds should be fine. There's more than, you know, there's a bunch of guys, and you've got stripper clips to reload it while it's in the gun. Um, it may very well have been this idea that you don't really get anything better out of 20 rounds because 20 rounds mean you have to use four stripper clips to reload it instead of just using two clips and then two more clips, which is the same total amount of time. There are, there, there are examples of French armorers making 20-round mags in the field. Um... But even as you go on, when the FAMAS was adopted, what was the mag's capacity? 25. And what year was this? 78. Okay, well, I mean, 30-round mags so, are a thing now. Yes, the reason for a 25-round mag is that was the longest they could get straight. Which is what the original AR-15 mag was. Yeah. The original AR yep. magazine was a 25-round straight box mag. Yep. Then went to a 20-round, and then when they made 30s, and they added the little... Do yeah. So... Also keep in mind that there was, through the whole time that they were issuing the Moss series, they were also issuing submachine guns. Hmm. They had a lot of MAP 49s. With so, more than 10 rounds. With 30 round mags. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's a shortcoming. It's annoying to me, but I don't think it's a huge deal. Frankly, they've never really, the French are, have weird history of magazines. Like, they never figured out how to make a Shoshan magazine without the holes. Yeah, that doesn't make sense either. That's another dumb. bizarre... Yeah. I mean, I understand why the holes were there. This is off-topic. Yeah. I understand why the holes were there. But, but they should at, understand why the holes shouldn't At one there. point, they should have gone, hmm, this was a bad idea. Stop doing this part where you make the hole. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally, just to leave that part out. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Scott says, I'm really interested in competing in Desert Brutality 2020, assuming it continues, but I have not done any competition shooting before. Mm. How should I start out, and what gear would you recommend at the minimum? I would hopefully be running my mostly accurate HK33K clone in the Classic Division. Um, my first recommendation is don't start in the classic division. Yeah, actually, that's what I was gonna. That was one thing I was gonna say. Um, classic division is probably the least is is one it's of the, the hardest. It's the least forgiving. Yeah, it is the hardest. Yeah. You know, I think it was actually hard. It's harder than armored plus B. Yeah, armored plus B, you got to carry a lot of garbage, but the guns you're using are really good. Yeah, classic. Mm -hmm. Not so much. It's the worst guns of the whole yeah. match. But what I was gonna say, the reason th this question was interesting for a couple of reasons. One, uh, this year in Desert Brutality 2019, I'm actually going with a home-built, brutalized AKM, Romanian AKM. Speaking of parts kits build. Yeah, it is, it is literally, there's parts in it that are bent, and it still runs. I mean, so I'm using a semi-bent AKM with a three-cell pouch, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm doing that isn't because I think it's going to win Classic, is to present the reality of how minimalistic can one approach the stages at a two-gun 
or at least one that we run, two gun or brutality match, um, and still be able to finish. Right. And I've always said that my stages are designed with the idea that the ACAM is the minimum rifle that's still capable on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and therefore the stages should be completable with an ACAM. And I'm using an ACAM this year, bone stock, to make that point. So you could go with an AKM, pockets to stick magazines into, and a good retention holster with pockets to stick magazines into, and you could shoot. You're not going to win, but you could shoot that way. In terms of actually garnering experience, I would think you should read the rules, watch the videos very closely, and um, start at a local event that's not as uh, big a deal. And it almost doesn't matter what kind of local event. Mm. If you haven't shot competition, the first hurdle to get over is being able to shoot under pressure, self-imposed pressure, of a timer and people watching you. Mm. And that's, that's not something to, to ignore. Like, that's an important skill set that you have to develop. Once you've got that, um, and perhaps more importantly, being able to maintain all of your safety awareness yeah. under, you know, now you're in the stress of the beepers going off and there's 12 dudes watching me and yeah. I'd, I'd better perform well enough to, you know, to uphold my honor, not look like an idiot, yeah. and well, certainly not do anything unsafe. So that's the first hurdle. Learn to do that. And you can do that at any style of match, really. Yep. Um, if there's a little movement, that's better, uh, just because that will give you a little bit of experience and practice moving with firearms on the clock. You but know what I think That's is, the first thing. There's that Glock match. Is it the GSSM it's called or whatever? I've that's, never attended one. I haven't either, but my, a buddy of ours goes to it every year, and it's, it's super beginner-friendly. Mm -hmm. I think that like if you can look for those Glock matches when they're around, that would be a really good venue to get your yeah. feet wet because they start things from low ready, not from the holster. They're very, very beginner-friendly, okay. and that'll get you going on terms of like safety discipline, the 180 trigger discipline, um, dealing with like timer and the stress of being watched. As far as gear, the best gear to bring is the gear that hinders you the least. So if you already have an HK-33K and you like it and you're practiced with it, great. If you are someone who doesn't have any guns for a match, like a reliable basic AR and any of the reliable modern pistols, like enough magazine capacity that you're not trying to... You're, don't use some $200 surplus pistol that has a seven-round mag no. that you're going to be trying to load. No, uh, that's like You want things that aren't going to get in your way. A lot of people think that they look at classic, and I think this is great that there's that, that people see what we're doing with these old guns and it inspires them to want to shoot matches. Mm -hmm. But that's really not the way to start shooting matches. Yeah. It's really it's really hard mode. Yeah, it is. And you're you're going to have more fun if you're willing to get the classic later and come out with a red dot sighted AR-15 and a Wonder Nine like a Glock. Yeah, you're going to have way more fun. I guarantee you, you're going to have more fun. Yeah. David and Jen ask, do either of you own any wall hanger firearms? And if so, why don't you shoot them? Um, are they unsafe, too valuable, historical value, sentimentality, etc.? Please include an example, or two examples. I think you have many. I have one right now that's that's kind of there, but someday is going to get shot. Um, at a gun show, gosh, it was probably a couple years ago now, I, find, I found a uh, Springfield 5070. Hmm. Yeah. So the 5070 was what came before the 4570 trapdoor, and it was used by most of the quote-unquote Indian or indigenous people because they were the guns that were kind of surplused away. The government played with them. They converted a bunch of 1861 Springfield muskets into, well, the locks, into these 5070s. And then they used them for a little while. They went, eh, we're going to go with 4570. And then they made complete rifles, usually not from surplus parts, but made them from scratch, mm -hmm. and then surplused out the 5070s, which is why they got into the hands of Indians. Um, so uh, I have a 5070 that is in reasonably good shape. The stock is not in great shape. And I've been slowly working towards casting my own bullets to finally fire it. But at this, I'm not going to fire it a lot. It's predominantly on the wall as a representation of the gun that came before the trapdoor. Yep. Um, I have a bunch. Um, a couple of, two examples I would come up with. Uh, one of them is a uh, Bannerman Spencer pump-action shotgun, mm -hmm. which is really cool because it's really the first marketed pump-action shotgun. The problem is it has a Damascus barrel, mm -hmm. And it's really old, and you actually loaded me some 12-gauge blanks for it. Yeah. I still haven't actually done anything with it. But mm -hmm. I plan to do a video with that using some blank ammo to demonstrate how it works, but I don't need to shoot high-pressure real ammo through that thing because mm -hmm. I could damage it, and it's a pump shotgun. It's like there's not—I don't, I don't need to go out and shoot this for any particular reason, so why would I risk the gun? 
But it is mechanically and historically very interesting. What year was that going? Originally, 1880. Oh, yeah. 1880, I think. Because the quintessential first, I mean, there were other pumps before this, but the pump that really took the field was the 1897. Right, yeah. But this is quite a bit before that. It is, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the other one would be my Carrossier Berthier, which is oh, yeah. the incredibly rare version meant for the guys who are still wearing armored breastplates and big fancy helmets. And that thing has a leather butt plate on it. And I've actually shot a different example. Uh, Patrick, uh, one of the, the French collectors, a well-known French collector in Albuquerque, has, mm -hmm. has one. Um, and I got to shoot his. And you know what? It shoots kind of like a carbine with a really uncomfortable comb. Um, I have no need to shoot mine and find out if I'm going to damage the leather butt plate or if maybe there's some little tiny crack in the stock that I haven't seen. Yeah. That running... A 232 grain bullet at 2,400 feet per second might expose and like make really big. I, there's no need to shoot it. Yeah, no reason to damage it. Yeah. It's a collectible. Uh, Justin says, regardless of current technological limitations, what, in your opinion, would constitute the perfect carbine optic? There is no perfect. It is all situational, and it always depends. What I like that answer. There is no perfect. Yeah. The closest thing, the closest thing, is is a quality red dot like an aim point. Totally depends what you want to do. But it's not perfect because you know you might need magnification. You might want a variable. You might not. I just I, yeah. I, I guess I guess what I mean by my default go to would be a, a quality red dot like an aim point. That because does not. That's the one that best fits the circumstances that you are most likely to use. It also in. addresses the wide most of the wide majority of situations in which you want to shoot something. However, it is by no means perfect. There are means there are times when you need something else. Aim point comp M5. Yeah, pretty much. Gory, the all-powerful, says, In a previous Q&A, you stated that of all the cap and ball revolvers, you'd carry an 1860 Colt. Mm -hmm. Why this instead of a Remington 1858 or something more, even more saucy like a Lamat? Do you, have a, do you, want, to, do you want to hit that? Or you want to the Lamat is awful. Yeah, it is. It is really uncomfortable to hold. It's really big. The center shotgun thing is interesting, but not exactly compelling. Don't need those blue whistlers that bad. The baby Lamat is actually a lot more comfortable. I could see that. It handles like an actual gun. But I'm not going to carry one of those because they cost like $50,000. And remember, the original Lamat wasn't even in 44. It was in 41. Two, I thought. 42. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that little... But, but, but... And this, the 1858? This comes up a lot. The Remington New Army, the 58. You hear this all the time. People go, but you could pull down the... The loading thing, and, or the, the ramrod, and then pull out the cylinder pin, and pull out a cylinder, put a new one in it. No, you can't. Um, the 1858, the cylinder pin is a, just a metal round pin that goes into the cylinder and locks it to place, and it's locked in place by the ramrod, uh, the bullet seater. And the reality is it fouls so quickly and so fast that it will, uh, trying to get that out to remove the cylinder after firing even one cylinder's worth of black powder means that that quick change cylinder is not real. As well as the A58 fouls so much and so badly, mostly around the cylinder pin, even when properly lubricated, that even if you don't change cylinders, after a couple cylinders worth of firing, you have to clean the gun thoroughly or it will be, require you to essentially psych, turn the cylinder with your support hand while cocking the hammer. The 1860, oh, the Colts in general, the 1860 as well, the uh, cylinder pin is integral to the frame, and it has what I would call um, tread in it. There's grooves cut into the cylinder pin, which are meant for dealing with that fouling. It turns out that the Colt is a far more reliable cap and ball revolver than the 58. What you have to remember with the Colt is that you have properly sized caps, right. and that you tend to cut, cut the, bring the gun up during recoil, and the cap will fall off and not into the action. But in terms of the Colt, Seizing up under fouling, it is a far more reliable gun than the, than the Remington, and that's the reason. All right, Icebreaker Interactive says, It's World War III in 1985. You are out of ammo, and you see among the deceased on the battlefield an M16A1, a Fowl, a G3, an AK-74, and an M49 Hovea. Which one do you reach for? M16. Yep, M16A1. No, no, not even a, no, no hesitation there at all. Yep. It is, it is so, I mean, those other guns are fine, but the M16 is definitely the best of that, yeah. by far. Brian says, why are grip safeties and trigger safeties not utilized in rifles and shotguns? Grip safeties and trigger safeties. Glock doodles. Oh, I think we should answer those separately. I think grip safeties aren't used because they suck. <laughs> grip safeties, I mean, they're always bad. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they had them in the Uzi, and then yeah. you find that you... 
I, I don't know how many times you guys have tried to fire an Uzi, but I can tell you that there's been, and I know this is a training thing, blah, 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 but but grip safety is inevitably you always just don't quite get it right. Like every once in a while and there's time stress or whatever, you don't squeeze it hard enough or whatever and the gun don't work. Uh, grip safeties are just, and here's another thing that I wondered about, the grip safety on the 1911. Mm -hmm. How is that useful? Well, it was a safety device before it had a thumb safety. Granted, but once you had the thumb safety, huh? It's a magazine cutoff. It's it, once the point being is the grip safety on a 1911. Once you have a grip on the gun and you're pulling it out of your holster, you have defeated the grip safety, which is when the gun is dangerous in terms of coming out of the holster and maybe sweeping yourself. Not that you should, but that's sure. yes, yes. So. What is this? <laughs> like, I, 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 I kind of am lost on this. So in terms of grip safety, I don't... Do you see a reason for them? Um, well, I think the reason that you have... It's not so much a reason, a question of why are they not on rifles and shotguns. It's a question of why are they on pistols. And the answer is because <laughs> they're the best of some not great options. You don't need a trigger or a grip safety on a long gun because you've got enough space in the action to have a really ergonomic, comfortable, and very effective thumb safety. Okay which is what you don't generally have on a pistol. I can see why we did why why it was on the Uzi. When you or any open bolt. Yes, the open bolt guns make a lot of sense. There's more sense to it. I, I just kind of said I don't mm -hmm. like it, but the re, the rationale there makes sense because an open bolt will fire when jarred or can fire when jarred, especially depending on the generation of the open bolt. And so the grip safety on the Uzi prevents that from happening. It's something that actually prevents the bolt from being able to drop and fire the gun. Right. So if you were to accidentally drop the gun, it won't fire. Okay. I guess, but but I think grip safeties have very limited application. If you could transplant an AR-15 safety onto a pistol, you wouldn't need all the debate about do you want it thumb, you know, do you want it on the slide or on the frame, or if we can. I mean, the whole reason trigger safeties exist is to avoid having any of the other types. Yeah, no, and the well, the well, the trigger safety on a Glock, for example. Um, makes a lot of sense and it also makes it drop safe. Yeah, exactly. Um, however, I think there's a good point here is that if you were to take a Glock, Glockish, I realize many pistols use this style of safety, but use a Glockish style trigger safety mm -hmm. and put it into, let's say, an AR-15, why is that a bad thing? Well, it wouldn't be a bad thing, it just isn't necessary. No, well, well, well no, but I, I have an answer, but I was, okay. this was a rhetorical question. So my first thought was that like my Ruger precision rifle mm -hmm. does have a trigger safety. It does, which but it is also... there to allow it to have a very light trigger pull. Mm -hmm. So that you can turn the safety off, but then if you bump the rifle and it falls over, it mm -hmm. won't fire. Okay, so more of a drop safe sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's my other rationale on this, especially in a military star rifle like an AR-15. Mm -hmm. The reason, if you were to add a trigger safety but as, an exec, as an additional, you don't need it because you already have a regular safety. And the reason you have a regular safety is because in a military star rifle, you are running through... You have gear on, you're running through debris, you're running through brush. Hmm. A, a, a stick or gear can still get hung up on a trigger safety and fire the gun. That's true. And an active safety on an AR-15 that you literally flick on or off means that if something accidentally hits your trigger, it's not going to fire the gun. That's a good point. So that would be my rationale for that. Yeah. And when you have a pistol out, that's less of a concern. Yeah. Because you are in control of the pistol. Right. Versus a rifle hanging on your sling or maybe bouncing around. Last page. John says, what did you guys think of They Shall Not Grow Old? I really liked it. I thought the technical aspects were fascinating. If you see it in the theater, you have the opportunity to stick around for about a half an hour worth of making of at the end that mm -hmm. is every bit as interesting as the film itself. Um, I think the artistic choice that they made to use only original footage mm -hmm. and only original veteran commentary, and mm -hmm. it's not even... It's not even like what a vet's wrote being reread. It is audio taken from interviews with these guys, I think in the 60s or 70s, where, when they were old, but not like totally decrepitly, creaky voiced old. Um, so the entire film is a documentary about the life of the average British soldier in World War I, shown, showing the average British soldier in World War I and being told by the average British soldier in World War I. And uh, the, the, the technical, the colorization and the sound recreation is absolutely, and the, the, I don't even know what you would call it, the restoration of the film, making it look like modern real film is absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna say the technical aspects, the colorization and the 3D was beyond phenomenal. 
amazing. It was like being there. It was like, yeah. oh my gosh, it's like I'm looking at World War One filmed yesterday. And that's exactly what the point was. Which was beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I think I understand why he took the narrative he did, which was from the average British soldier's perspective of being in the war. And I think that for the regular audience, that's exactly the right choice, and I think it's a fantastic film. For me, however, I know that they also cleaned up all of the archival footage, and I would have liked to have seen a broader scope of depth of conversation about things. I would have liked to have seen aircraft. I would have liked to have seen more than just... And I know this sounds weird, but the standard narrative of day in the trench, day in the trench, jump over the trench, die, day in the trench is something we know about World War I. And this is no different in terms of that, although True. it's brought from the voices of the men that were there. However, I would have liked to have seen a bigger perspective. They did have about 100 hours of footage to work with to turn into about a 90-minute documentary. So I'm not saying it's not yeah. great. It is. I just would have liked to have seen a broader perspective on the war. Hopefully. I think as part of making this, he did restoration on, I believe, the entirety of yep. the Imperial War Museum's film archive from World War I which means that that is now available to other filmmakers and researchers. And so I'm, I'm pretty confident that we'll start to see that other footage come out in other productions. At the end, during that 30 minutes that Ian was speaking of, in which Peter Jackson talks about the work, mm -hmm. they show other footage that they cleaned up. And oh, they show some awesome stuff. They show some aircraft. Yeah. And the minute I'm like, I want to jump out of my seat. I'm like, that's what I want to see. <laughs> like, why that, that should have been in the movie. Like, and, and I understand why it wasn't. But I think, and again, for the average audience, it's going to be an incredible, mind-blowing experience. And you should see it regardless, because it is technically that. I just would have liked the narrative to be broader. Alex says, are revolvers obsolete for combat? God, we love that word now. Apparently you do. You, you pulled these questions out. No, I mean, obsolete was all over the place. Uh, but, but you know what? Are, are revolvers obsolete for combat? Yes. Are they obsolete for self-defense? No. Okay. That's different. Okay. What do you think? I think I'm going to move on to the next question. Okay, I'm going to say yes, they are obsolete for combat, but they're not obsolete for self-defense. So I think there's a lot of purpose for maybe someone wanting to carry one for that purpose, like a concealed carry weapon. But in terms of taking it into war? Huh? Yeah. They were obsolete in World War I. James says, legalities aside, would you please explain the benefits and negatives of concealed carry versus open carry? Oh. Yeah. I have favored open as a deterrent, like a security sign on the front lawn, but now that there's a big push for concealed, which is really better. I think open carry is a terrible idea. I'm not talking about from a, from a, from a social perspective. I'm talking about from a tactical perspective. Why would you, first of all, as a deterrent? I don't know that that is a deterrent. Like, um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the reality is, is that if someone is, is hell-bent on causing a problem that day, you're just the first target. You're also potentially like a walking gun dispenser. You are that as well, and there's a lot of footage of that. Now, I'm not saying that, what's his name, I'm sorry? Uh, James. James, I'm not trying to offend you. Um, James, I don't know what your situational awareness is, but I know what mine is. And I know that my situational awareness is not constantly always on, on high alert. And, um, I, and obviously, we would like to think that we're always on some sort of high alert status everywhere we go in life. And if you're one of those people, I kind of feel bad for you because that's a crappy way to live. But if that is where you're at, then so be it. And that's something that you need to be when you have an open carry pistol. Yeah. Um, open, uh, but uh, a concealed carry pistol, first of all, someone doesn't know you have it, right, because it's concealed. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be aware, but the reality is it's not obvious that it's on you, meaning that you're not a gun dispenser. You're also not necessarily a target. And I will challenge the, na the, 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 na the narration or the statement that is a deterrent. Uh, to me, the, the justification for open carry, the, the proper, like, the place where it's totally proper and legit to open carry is out in the field. Oh, yeah, out in the desert. Uh, By the way, out in the desert, when you're out hiking around and you're open carrying, that's a different thing than going to the local Walmart. Right. I'm, I'm taking this under the auspices yeah. and under the aspect of a normal concealed carry day. Well, what I want to point out here is there's a difference between saying you, you shouldn't open carry and saying that, well, we don't need to be allowed to open carry. The thing is, oh, yeah. there are some places where it's totally, it is the best option, like out hiking, out hunting, um, where you don't, it, it's much easier to carry a gun open than concealed. Oh, yeah, you yeah. don't have to try and stuff it, you know, inside clothing, under a belt. Mm. You can have a much more comfortable holster. Totally. Hangs off the side. It's nice. And then the other benefit of an open carry law is that it means that you are not necessarily penalized if you happen to goof. Like, yeah, if totally. I bend over and back of my shirt comes up and, oh, he's got a gun there, in some places, that that's a crime. When that happens, you, you are now breaking the law. And that's, that's just... It, 
it's not right. It shouldn't be. Let me clarify, mm -hmm. I, I, so people get this yeah. crystal clear. I am not saying it should be illegal to open carry. Right. I'm not saying there should be laws preventing it. This question is... You just shouldn't do it. <laughs> James's question said legalities aside. So I was addressing it from the perspective of social slash tactical slash application. Right. Legally, yes, you should be legally allowed to. I'm not... That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that legally allowed to, why do you want to? Right. I it, think it, that the detriments are greater than the benefits. It should be legal to run down the street with no clothes on. But you shouldn't do it. Oh, okay. Most but, people shouldn't do but, that. But, 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 <laughs> I'm not, I am not saying it should be illegal. Right. That is not my point. Right. My yeah. point, and, and you make a very salient one in that, in some places it is illegal to the point where if you are legally concealed carrying and then suddenly you see it, you're now committing a crime. That's absurd. Um, but the, I do not believe it's much of a deterrent, if a deterrent at all. I agree. It does put you at higher risk of being a target and or your firearm being taken away from you. And if you were attacked with no warning, no matter how alert you are, and you're now being thrown to the ground and you're in a grappling situation, in a concealed carry situation, your gun not being revealed may very well be a beneficial thing right. that the person doesn't know they have a gun available to them to use on you should you lose control of the situation. When it's open carry, they very much know that there's a gun there for them to take control of. Yeah. There are real serious tactical applications there that are yeah. risky. All right. Uh, Andrew says, why were pump action military rifles not a thing? Oh, we kind of addressed this earlier. Um, pump action rifles just don't work so hot. Yeah. I mean, why, it, it's not an optimal system. Let's put it this way. Lever action military rifles were not a thing. And if lever action ones were not a thing, well, with rare exception, some Henrys were used, and we know the 1890, the Russian 1895, was used in the in in, in Russia, but but really they weren't a thing. Yeah. And then okay, we know Turkey and all that. Like, got it. But but really they weren't. So if lever actions were never a military thing, pump actions would definitely not be a thing. Yep. Fred, uh, any thoughts on buying and restoring surplus military vehicles as a project car? Are they worth the headache? I wanted you to have this one. Oh, I had it. Wasn't quite military, but I had a 1946 CJ2A Jeep. Uh, it was absolutely not worth the headache <laughs> to me. Yeah. And I remain in this but you laugh. You've got something close. I do. Um, I'm fighting with that car all the time. Yeah. Um, I still love the idea of having one. I think they're fantastic. And every time I mm. go to a place like a military vehicle show and I see, like, a Dodge weapons carrier, mm. just, oh, yeah, I want it. Yeah, totally. And I have to, you know, hit myself. Bad, bad. Get the little spray bottle. <laughs> bad. The no bottle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no, think about... The, the problem is, I love the idea of those vehicles, but when it comes right down to it, I want to get in, turn the key, and drive away. Yeah. And I don't want to have to worry about letting it warm up, dealing with the choke, adjusting the carburetor for different seasons. Like, oh, I'm going from southern Arizona at 1,000 feet elevation to northern Arizona at 6,000 feet elevation, and now my fuel air balance is wrong, and the car's not going to run right unless I get under the... Uh, you and just use the C word, carburetor. No, and, just yeah. say no to carburetors. And none of them have air conditioning, which is a oh. thing down here in southern Arizona. Yep. Just, ugh, for me, it is absolutely not worth the headache. Maybe someday I'll be a multi-gazillionaire, and I can, like, play Jay Leno and be like, this is my garage with all of my cars, and this is the team of engineers and mechanics yep. that I pay, like, yep. I employ full-time to maintain my collection of half-tracks. Yep, yep. This is a lot like the, actually, this, the answer to this is very similar to the parts kits. Yeah. If you're yeah. a person that's that person and you want to build your own AK because you want to build your own AK, go for it, man. That's great. But oh, yeah. if you're that kind of person that wants to be turning wrenches and changing the carburetor because you changed altitude or the weather's different or dealing with the fact that the cable broke on your brake line today, if, you, if you're that guy, great. They're cool. But the reality is they're not practical. And they're a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> they just are. Mm. Yeah, so either embrace it yeah. or just say no. Uh, Carl says, Carl, you mentioned you have Norwegian roots. Mm. What is your relationship to Norwegian culture, food, language, customs, etc.? And have you ever visited the old country? Uh, I have not. I've not been to Norway. Uh, my my grandparents came here in 1936. In fact, I was just looking at this the other day. It's amazing. Mm. Went on the internet and I found the Ellis Island records. Oh, cool. And not only did I find their manifest, I found their names there, but I found the picture of the ship. Wow. That's pretty wild. That's cool. That's really cool. So uh, really only two generations away because yeah. my, my mother was born here and then I was born obviously from her. Um, my home was run 
mixed American Norwegian culture. We had Norwegian food, some Norwegian music. Um, uh, they did speak Norwegian, but told me I didn't need to learn it. So there's like That's words. A shame. Yeah, it is. But I hear the words in my head and I can hear the sounds. And I know some of the words. And there's a couple things here and there that the first word's Norwegian and then the subsequent word is English and I have to translate it. Just a couple. Mm. Like things that I learned as a kid, like the first word I learned for it was in Norwegian. Mm. But very little. Um, so I have this weird like mixed foot, one foot in Norwegian culture and obviously my, my, I'm really American across the board. But there was a Norwegian, a strong Norwegian influence in my life from up until my teens. Okay. So yes, there's that. But I have not been to Norway, no. I've been to Finland. You did spend some time taking Norwegian lessons. I did, I did. Um, there was a teacher here in Tucson, an elderly lady. She was really nice and um, from Norway. In fact, she gave me her memoir. Hmm. I could publish this. Maybe the audience would like this. She gave me a two-sheet memoir of her and her family in uh, Norway when it was occupied. Oh, that's And she cool. had a memory of the Germans driving their cars around huh. and stuff. Very interesting. And she was, she was an older lady, obviously, and she was teaching Norwegian. I thought it'd be fun to relearn a yeah, language that absolutely. I should have learned, and she died. Uh, she passed away, and she was the Norwegian teacher here. Yeah, you like, can't imagine there are all that many. She was the Norwegian. Yeah. There's like one maybe other one, but she was the Norwegian teacher in Tucson, and that went away with her. So uh, that stopped. But the uh, memoir was fascinating because I remember reading it, and one of the things she said in there is that the Norwegian people, as a rule, didn't have mechanized vehicles. Hmm. And so when they heard an engine, everyone knew it was German, hmm. and it made everyone on edge because they didn't know if they were coming to your door or not. Um, so she had memories of that. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, it is. Uh, X51, oh lord, there's another one. 1911, would you put it as being obsolete or in obsolescence? Obsolete or obsolescent? The 1911. Are we talking, okay, let's, let's, let's put clarifications around this because the 1911 has been modified a lot over time. True. Are we talking about a modern 1911 with all the modern accoutrements or are we talking about a GI spec 1911 from 1943? I have no idea. Let's go with the GI. He one. does not specify. He didn't specify, so let's go GI. I'm going to call it obsolescent. Okay. Not obsolete. It is a semi-automatic pistol that's reliable. Um, it is box magazine fed. Um, it is accurate enough for all its intended purposes. But in a world of Wonder 9, it is behind the curve. Do you agree? For me. You don't want to deal with this obsolete I, thing? I'm kind of tired of obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> I think obsolete has become obsolete. Yeah. Uh, Yemen says, a repeat question, since it uh, seems to have been skipped in last month's video, what are your thoughts on rifle-only run-and-gun type matches? Oh, I think they're great. I love the idea. Actually, yeah. if I had to choose, I would probably take a rifle match over a two-gun match. Really? Um, given equal, I mean, all else being the same. Mm -hmm. I just like rifles more than I like pistols. Well, it also, I mean, if your interest is in military application, it's really the rifle, not the pistol, that has purpose. Yeah. I think two-gun, even though when you look at our two-gun, um, we are weighted more on the rifle than the pistol mm -hmm. at stage design. Um, I think the pistol has a place, although I think that regular just rifle-only matches are awesome, and I have no problem with them at all. You know, there are one or two every year here up in Phoenix. Yeah. Um, the Independence Day match is a rifle-only match. Yep, yep, yep. And one of the things I really like about that match is it's much easier for me to do some sort of cool vintage overall thing. And the gear. Because military loadouts almost never have pistols in them. Yep, yep. You look at historical military loadouts, these guys, you don't carry a rifle and a pistol in the military. At least you didn't until very recently if you do today. And I think most people still don't today. So there are things like, I have a South African pat Pattern 83 combat vest, mm. which is a really cool piece of kit. But there's like no way to hold a pistol. You're like, where it. do you put this thing? Right. You can yeah. like stick it in a magazine pouch or something. Which is not a good idea. But there's just no good way. I can't yeah. wear a belt with it because it comes all the way down to the waist. Mm. Um, if you want to do something like, well, like a, an M1 Garand, as we were just talking about. Okay, I've got my, my web belt for the Garand clips, and I can put an old leather 1911 holster hanging off of that belt. That's cool. Yep. But when I want magazine pouches, problem. the mag pouches are go over just a plain web belt. And so, like, that gets tricky to do. Ironically, you could do it better with a bar rig. You could, yeah. yeah. Um, Rifle only simplifies a lot of this. I can just take standard stock web gear and use it. And, and of course, Red October is rifle only, too. That's true. I yeah. don't have a problem with, with rifle only matches at all. I think they have a lot of merit. I think it's something we, we might want to look at with, with not if we were to do more brutality matches, maybe more than one a year. I think it would be interesting to do rifle only or rifle centric yeah. ones, too. Yeah. It's half as much gear to lug around, half yeah. as much ammo, half as much investment. 
But I don't think that the other reason rifles are more fun than pistols is because pistols are harder. That's true. So I don't know that, that we should avoid pistols. They're harder, but they're also more limited in a lot of ways. Yeah, like, but they're you also can't more... do some of the range, long range type no, stuff. But they're also easier to run because the range requirements are less too. That's true. So there's a real, yeah. um, and you're more likely to have a pistol with you someday in life than a rifle. That's true. So, but less, I think I think less you're open carrying in Texas. I get. <laughs> I guess what I would say is that any single style of gun only thing, pistol only, rifle only thing. There's no reason. They're, they're, they're great. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anonymous says, have you ever considered running or participating in a shooting competition with nighttime or low light shooting? Oh, Clearly just, never. Never. I just did. Um, <laughs> they are very rare. Um, the reason they're rare is that they are highly, um, you have to have fairly competent people participating in them because otherwise they're a very unsafe environment. Yeah. Um, so for example, I just shot a low light match just a couple days ago to uh, profile a light that we got for in range. And I put some pictures up on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, and, um, and I've done some night vision stuff too, but that's even more rare because most people don't have that stuff. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is that when you were running the timer at this match, the person I knew that I was running the timer for was someone I knew was a um, fairly a competent and long-term competition shooter. And so when the lights went off and it was inky blackness, I did not have to worry about that person's finger on the trigger or them maintaining the 180 when they move from position A to position B, because I couldn't see if they were doing that or not. I knew they were, because I knew them. If you bring that to a public event where anyone can come, you really, really, really are playing with fire, because you can't do proper RO-type procedures on them or with them, and you don't know if they're doing things like finger on trigger or breaking the 180. And no matter how competent you are, there's always things like, maybe there's a stick on the ground or a rock on the ground that you're going to trip on because it's dark and you can't see it. Yep. There are definitely way more potential safety hazards at a, a match in the dark. So they're awesome, but I think that they have to be very rare and they have to be, unfortunately, and this sounds elitist, it isn't meant to be, but they have to be sort of invite only. Yeah. Um, additionally, there's other stuff that comes into play at low light that you just don't even think about. Like your pockets matter so much more. I mean, this sounds silly, yeah. but like, for example, let's say you have a red light with your red lamp so that you can move around. Like when you're trying to reload your mags, mm -hmm. you put that in this pocket, you put some mags in this pocket. You, when it's dark enough, you have to remember what pocket <laughs> has what thing in it to you. No, I'm serious. Yeah. And like, or feel, physical feeling and feedback. Like my, one of my, I had a malfunction on my gun during one of the courses of fire. I could not see. Because I turned to, the light off, I couldn't see what happened. Kind of hard to turn your weapon light on your weapon. So I, t so I turned, I, I just cleared it and dealt with it by tactile. And that's something that's only done over time and experience. I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying I've done it a lot. And all the people at this match have done it a lot. And that's the kind right. of stuff that happens. Yeah. All right. And our very last question. Matthew says, hi, Ian and Carl. Years ago, I asked some old firearms historians why the U.S. military never widely adopted lever guns. I was told the Army decided lever guns were too difficult to operate while shooting prone. According to your research, is this true? I don't think there's a problem with shooting lever guns prone. You turn the gun to the side, run it, fire, run it, fire, run it, fire. It's not that much more difficult than running a bolt. I can see the military thinking it would be, though. Okay. Um, I think military reliability was probably a bigger issue for them. Mm. Concerns about things like if you dent that magazine tube, the gun doesn't work anymore. Sure. Um, uh, granted, this is all a conjecture on my part, based on and a little bit of historical context, mm -hmm. like looking at what decisions have been made in the broader context. I have not actually gone into specific archives to look at, you know, oh, we we trialed this 1876 and we decided not to use it because of this. The gun is prone. I haven't seen that documentation. Yeah. Um, I suspect while that I, that may have been a, a given reason, but I don't think it's the most legitimate reason. I really think it's more about durability. This is something we need to do eventually on some of the video with the lever guns because this comes up a lot where people go, you can't use them prone, and that's not true. It really isn't. Oh, you can totally use You literally them. camp yeah. the gun to the left or to the right and go click and like yeah. click. And it, it's this, this is not that different than... It's actually easier than a bolt gun in many ways because you don't lose your grip on it. Well, yeah. You pretty much keep the same grip on the gun as your cycle. The prone lever gun thing isn't, isn't, isn't really a problem. Yeah. Um, so I think there were other things at play, yeah. but it wasn't that. Well, that was a good one. Ooh, Lots of good questions. Long. Yeah. Yep, it was. Uh, we would like to thank everyone for that are Patreon supporters that provided these questions. 
we'd like to thank everyone that's a supporter patreon or otherwise if you're not already a patreon supporter uh, please consider so um, we started a dollar and there's perks at all different levels above we mentioned the buyers club at the beginning we got cool discounts from people like brownells k arms yeah. a whole wide variety of people um so there's like a whole bunch of vendors in there and you get cool discount codes from the virus lake is another one so uh, go ahead i was gonna say a link to the patreon account is in the description text and you can see the whole list of what you can get from everybody down in there yeah cool so if you can't do that we totally understand not everyone can uh at best, please check us out on any of our multiple distribution networks. You can find them all at nrange.tv and share with your friends. Thanks.